All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going, team? Here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode ninety-eight, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in the podcast form. And um, since this is sort of the beginning of the year, we don't really have that much happening yet, right? But we do have some very interesting things that were released and updated today. So. Let's get cracking. As usual, the first section of the podcast is getting started uh, with all the best articles to get you started in various things. We got uh, four of them today. The first one here is uh, JavaScript promises versus RxJS observables. That does a very good job of comparing uh, the JavaScript promises, as you might imagine, and RxJS observables. So if you never heard about RxJS, it's a very powerful tool that can help you handle a lot of things and uh, it making basically it makes working with the synchronous data a lot easier. Now, promises on its own are really great concept, but they do have some shortcomings. Like for example, there's some issues with cancellation with laziness and with unicasting multicasting and so on and so forth. So Observables sort of address a lot of that in their own way while also adding a bunch of power tools uh, and specifically RxJS in this case. And uh, I honestly was very excited when I've seen the observables um, proposal to for the yeah, let me try that again. When I've seen the proposal for observables to be added as the core uh, abstraction within the JavaScript to the language, but I think it actually never moved anywhere from stage zero even. I don't think it, I don't even think it was stage one. But nonetheless, RxJS is here. It's a great library. And if you never heard about it, or maybe you heard and you were confused as to why you need observables uh, instead of promises, while they kind of look similar, right? This article does a very good job of basically comparing them and explaining where observables are better than promises and when exactly should you use them. Right, next article we got here is how to turn a Procreate drawing into a web animation. Not strictly JavaScript, but um, this one is actually really cool. So, uh, you know, my wife is an artist, so she does the, she uses the Procreate a lot. This is an iPad drawing tool, which is quite powerful and you can do a lot of really cool stuff. And recently they've added the animation tool set to it. So you can actually like export proper animations there and this tutorial shows you how you can draw something on the iPad and then turn it into a full on 3D animation right on the web, which is kind of bonkers. I mean, it's mostly CSS in this case and parallax layers and stuff like this. But if that sounds interesting, definitely check it out. It's really, really cool. Uh, let me have a look at the chat. RxJS made me change the way I think about programming for good. Yes, React, like the, the whole reactive programming paradigm is really, really... Uh, I mean, it, it does changes the way you think about the code in general. So when I started exploring RxJS and when I finally learned it and implemented it in one of my first projects, it also did change uh, quite a bit how I think about the, you know, the everything that is basically asynchronous, the asynchronous data flows, asynchronous actions, and so on and so forth. I uh, definitely can relate. Uh, anyway, continuing, we got pattern matching in JavaScript. A uh, really nice write-up that basically starts by saying, hey, we got this uh, pattern matching proposal that looks like this. So if you've never seen it, it's uh, really cool. And I honestly cannot wait for this proposal to be added to the language itself because I think we're missing pattern matching a lot. And at least I am missing pattern matching a lot in JavaScript because it's a very powerful tool that uh, usually helps you write a lot more um, functional code. Let's put it this way, right? As in the functional programming, not functional as in working. So this is the proposal. You have this case when thing where you can use destruction and matching specific uh, parts of the object or thing that you pass to it that works. It looks amazing. And again, you know, I cannot wait until it actually makes it into the language. I believe it's like stage one right now. Yep. So it's still work in progress. Maybe we'll see it sometime this year, maybe next year, who knows? Uh, the process is not always straightforward as we've seen on other proposals. It might, you know, roll back and roll forward and there might be some breaking changes and so on and so forth. Still quite excited about that. But what's cool about the article, it actually goes into saying that, okay, so this all is great and all, and we have to wait until it gets to stage three, maybe stage four until we start actually using it. So how can we do pattern matching now in JavaScript like today? And then it goes into examples with like using switch, using value mapping, using regular expressions and supercharged switch, which is actually uh, one of the 
really um I mean I I would call it nice hacks to be honest but uh yeah it's it's actually a really good write up on basically the um options of doing that so if you are interested if those sound interesting if you maybe never heard about some of those definitely check it out Hey Boxbox welcome to the stream um Yes, I am a JavaScript developer, among other things, but uh, JavaScript is sort of my primary language. Right, continuing uh, to close off the getting started section, we got uh, all questions, the type of NAN JavaScript quizzes. So this is a set of quizzes. A lot of them is something you typically would see on an interviews, and a lot of them are quite good, but there are some that are, you know, a bit iffy and I would personally consider to be bad questions. Like the, what was it? There was the, the Q thing. Um, oh man, where was it? I remember seeing it somewhere here. Come on, I don't know you were here. Um, anyway, ah, there you go, Curly Q, there we go. So yeah, so the, the question, you know, with the line breaks and how would that be interpreted by the uh, compiler, which, I mean, you know, it's not hard to answer but this is something that should be answered by ESLint or Prettier, basically. <laughs> I also want to be a JS developer to get super rich ASAP. Um, that usually doesn't work like this. I mean, you can learn JavaScript, you can be a developer, but getting super rich is not as easy as you make it sound. <laughs> anyway, and the next section as usual we got is articles and news. We got two things here today. The first one being the state of installability, a really nice write up that uh, shows the journey of the um, author, how they basically took their progressive app app and tried to publish it on variety of app stores and uh, how it went and basically what is needed to publish it. How does the, you know, if the stores are um, friendly to the progressive app apps, if they actually just index it like the Microsoft store, for example, does, or if there are any additional steps to actually publish your pub progressive app app as a proper platform application. So in this case, uh, it first shows the matrix uh, with, um, yeah, let me just no copy image location with the different platforms. And we also want it to be a lot larger, like something like this. Uh, what I found interesting is that it surprised me that the web iOS, like the progressive web app support on iOS is still really, really bad. Like this is, you still don't have offline work. You still don't have push notifications. I assume this is because the service workers are not there, right? Uh, okay, interapp comms, same thing basically, but I mean, they are not supported on majority of, uh, I mean, you, you get the shared workers now, right? Which should be, which is not exactly interapp, it's within the app itself anyway. But yeah, so this is like the iOS is, is very, very sad to see in this matrix essentially. Now, the interesting thing is that basically the authors go to show how does it work with, you know, whole adding to the home screen, what is kind of the implications of that, because, for example, on uh, Android, the add to home screen for the long time was just basically a shortcut that opens another browser tab, which I guess, you know, it's convenient, but it's not really a progressive app app. While nowadays you actually get a full on standalone container that will launch your app that have it like an isolated environment and everything, which is a lot nicer. Um, the cool thing is that they, uh, they, they touch on the web APKs and the way that you know you can actually take your progressive web app and package it into a special APK that you can then publish to uh, Android, uh, um, what is it called, Play Store. Uh, as a proper app, so it will going to be indexed, it's going to have its own permissions, it's going to have its own like statistics and everything, and the user can properly uninstall it as a native app, which uh, can be quite nice. Um, yeah, iOS is, as I said, it's still a pain in the ass. I mean, it kind of works. Again, Safari on iOS is lagging behind, well, pretty much all the other mobile browsers, to be honest. Still a pain in the ass to deal with, but... Um, well, hopefully they'll basically catch up. The desktop apps, so as you might know, the Chrome and Edge, the new one, uh, allow you to install progressive web apps as a desktop app, so you can actually get like a full-on uh, window to do that. Firefox uh, team said they are working on that functionality, but it's gonna be released in the next months. They're not even sure when, so I mean, I guess it's gonna come at some point, but honestly, the installing apps, right, progressive app apps, or even not progressive apps, even installing the websites as uh, window apps, 
was a really cool thing for me because it basically allowed me to remove, I don't know, six or seven apps that I regularly use and just install them as a progressive app apps because I now have like, you know, Slack and Discord and what else? Um, Skype and all that kind of stuff is just, just a basically a progressive app app that takes nearly zero space on my hard drive and just runs through the browser so it doesn't have to drag in a bunch of other libraries that it has to run the same bloody browser most of the time, right? So this is kind of nice. And uh, on one hand, I kind of want to see the Firefox do the same. On the other hand, I'm like once Edge updates to support all the features I need, I don't even sure I'm going to use Firefox. Like as you can see here, I migrated to Firefox. So this is actually Firefox. And I've been using it as my primary browser for the past month or so, but there is so many tiny annoying issues with it is just incredible. Like you would think by this time they would fix all of that, but no. Anyway, uh, now we're coming to the store presence. So they talk about the store presence this is exactly what I was talking about. So the cool thing again is Microsoft is basically straight up indexing progressive web apps. So if you go to the Microsoft store and search for an app that you know is a progressive web app, it will just show up there because the Bing indexed it, which is kind of awesome. Uh, with uh, Play Store, as I said, you have to do this web APK thing, which is not exactly super hard. I mean, there's tooling and tutorials that are relatively straightforward. Um, now the, the um, App Store, the iOS App Store is quite annoying because first of all, they don't allow you to publish anything that is basically a wrapper of a web view, right? So it has to be more than that. It has to be like a proper app. So in this case, <laughs> what the authors did were to um, take the React Native and then put the browser window in there to add some you know, minor additional things around that and just publish that, which I guess technically qualifies as native app, but it's still just a wrapper for a web view, which is a bit silly, but um, it works. So, you know, why not? Uh, but yeah. Like the the I, I think I feel like the Microsoft's approach to the whole like you know if it's a progressive app app we're just gonna index it and we're gonna add it to the store right away is possibly the best way. Again, they do offer you to do the same thing with just you know packaging with with a specific Apex format and then publishing it manually if you want to do anything with uh, metadata, I guess. But it's pretty cool. So if you're interested in more details, do check out the article. There are some very interesting things here and there and. Uh, Overall, uh, it's it's actually quite interesting to see how far the progressive web apps developed in the past three, four years, I guess. Because like, if you would tell me a few years ago that I would be able to like remove half of my native apps and just use uh, progressive web apps that are installed as, as wrappers, I guess, in my start menu, I would not believe you. But now, yeah, there we go. It actually works quite nice. All right. Next article we got here for today is inside note, what happens when we execute a script. Uh, now this one's really cool. So this is not what you expect. This does not really talk about, you know, the um, event loop or heaps or stacks or whatever. What this does is actually looks at the Node.js and how exactly does it execute a path, uh, sorry, the file by uh, walking along the path uh, within the source code of Node.js itself. So where's the entry points and it literally goes, the author goes into, you know, like, okay, let's just clone the Git repository for Node.js. Let's find the entry point, which is node start in C, right? And then let's just walk through the code and see how exactly the app executes, which is pretty fascinating. There are some things under here that I did not know Node actually does when you run a script, which was uh, pretty cool to read through. So if you're using Node and you were always curious at how exactly uh, does Node executes the files, what exactly happens, how does the JavaScript part of the Node gets loaded into memory, and when it is when is the environment set up, and all that kind of stuff, do check it out. It's really really cool. Um, how does you know all of that stuff is pretty fascinating. I mean it's not very long um, because you know the the very basic path is relatively straightforward, but it's still very interesting read, and uh, I would highly recommend going through that if you are working with Node.js. All right, that is it for articles and news. We got uh, tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness next. We got two things here. The first one is this article from Vasmer guys, which is uh, building graphical applications with Vasmer and uh, Vasi. So um, yeah, so essentially what they did is the Vasmer team announced the IO devices access through WebAssembly. 
which means that you can take your WebAssembly app and access any IO device, be it screen, be it user input, be it, I don't know, whatever the hell you want, basically, right? Uh, which means that you can, for example, take um, Game Boy Advance emulator and then just compile it to WebAssembly and then run it from WebAssembly with the whole screen and, you know, the whole ROM emulation, essentially. They also give examples of stuff like Doom 3, uh, GDevelop Construct 3 engines that allow you to basically output the games as a WebAssembly. Which sounds insane, to be honest, but also really, really cool at the same, at the same time, so... <laughs> Uh, not much, not much more to say than that. There are some technical details in here, so if you are curious, do check it out. But yeah, it literally allows you to run a full-on Game Boy emulator right in your browser with the emulated screen, basically, which is just bonkers. <laughs> so quite excited about that. Do check it out if that sounds interesting. It is uh, really uh, like <laughs> the WebAssembly is becoming this crazy thing that just can do everything and slightly faster than JavaScript, but you can also use it within JavaScript, which is uh, probably perfect, um, but there we go. All right, and the last thing we got here is the Browser 2020, a really nice collection of things that browsers can do in 2020. So this is sort of, I guess, continuation of the whole progressive web apps um, topic, right? And the idea was to collect all the things that the browser allows you to do, like, you know, prefer use motion, prefer color schemes, Payment API, Web Share API, Push API, Service Workers, uh, install um, app installs essentially was something we talked about just before. Uh, I don't know related apps, WebXR, uh, something that I still have to get my hands on. But the you know the whole like VR AR from the web sounds pretty damn cool. Media session, Chrome Sender API. This is something. Oh, okay, this is a Chromecast. This is something I've never heard about. <laughs> AirPlay, apparently they have their own web API as well, which is, again, something I did not know about. Force Touch, which is slowly dying, but still exists. Uh, AR, Quick Look, and a bunch of other crazy things. I did not know about, like, about half of those, and it's really awesome this exists. So if you are curious as to what your browser can actually do in year 2020, do check this collection out. It's actually quite a lot and um, keeps expanding, basically. So I feel like, you know, at one point we want even... Probably the web is going to be this ultimate platform for all most of the apps. Let's just not say all of them, because, you know, there's still cases when you want like full on uh, low level access, but uh, for most cases it's gonna be good enough. All right, this is it for the tips, tricks and bit sized awesomeness. Now we're coming to the releases section. We got quite a few this time around. Uh, the first one being Ava version three, which um, the biggest change, so the breaking change is essentially that it removes the Babel from the core by saying, hey, the most cool things that are stage four are adopted pretty quickly, so there's no reason to bring in Babel by default. You can still do it, but you would have to install it separately, which makes perfect sense in my book. And uh, it also adds supports for the uh, ES modules, so you can now use CGS and MGS files without any third-party tooling, essentially, which, you know, again, pretty great to see the um, apps or tools adopt the ES modules out of the box without any additional tweaking, because as far as I know, most of the old tools in Node.js still don't really play well with MJS modules uh, to this date, which, I mean, you know, it's not a big surprise, it was at least like a couple of months ago, but yeah, it's going to take some time to adopt all of that. <laughs> but anyway, if you are using Ava, do check this out. Uh, they've also added the debug mode that allows you to debug your test scripts in Chrome DevTools or VS Code Debugger, which seems pretty nice. And uh, yeah, that's basically all the changes. Right, uh, the next release we got here is Yarn version two, the new version of major version of Yarn that does have some breaking changes, but the migration guide is surprisingly simple. So you're probably not gonna have any issues with migrating. The, uh, there's a bunch of highlights, so they did quite a lot of changes to it, obviously. My personal highlights are, first of all, the um, command line commands like yarn up and yarn add are now workspace aware, which means that whenever you have a repo with workspaces, and if you run yarn adds package to a specific um, a repository, oh, sorry, the specific workspace, it will actually ask you which version to add based on all the other workspaces or packages and workspace that you have. 
so that you no longer have to search around manually and say, okay, so which one did I use? It will actually suggest you and say, okay, here's the one that is used by other package. Do you want to use it or use the latest one? Which is quite handy because honestly, that was one of the most annoying things about uh, using workspaces. Now, another thing is this Yarn DLX uh, thing, which is um, analogous to NPX, but only for remote scripts. So one of the things uh, that I always found annoying by NPX is that it also, so basically what NPX does, it allows you to run the remote commands as well as the local ones, right? So you can do NPX, I don't know, build. And if you have build script and NPM, it will actually run it, right? Which is, can be a bit confusing. Let's just put it this way. Now the DLX is limited to only pulling the binaries from the remote. So it literally just downloads and then executes. It won't run the local command which can be quite helpful. There's also a bunch of improvements to workspaces, uh, protocol for local file resolution and other things like this. So if you are using Yarn, make sure to check out this article that outlines all these things. Um, that's, yeah, I mean, it, it looks pretty good. I'm still using Yarn to this day because it seems to be more consistent for me than NPM, but um, yeah, well, let's see how that develops. Right, continuing, we got HTM version 3, which adds static subtree caching, uh, support for Preact X, uh, auto import, Pragma, option for Babel HTM plugin, and a bunch of other minor updates. If you never heard about HTM, it's a super nice little tool that allows you to essentially write JSX without bringing in a JSX compiler. So you can say use React, Preact, or any other JSX based. UI library in the browser without actually pre-compiling anything. Works really well and now has, you know, subtree caching, which is kind of awesome, as well as a bunch of other tools. Uh, so yes, if, if you are interested, do check it out. If you're already using it, make sure to update it. Basically should bring you some uh, nice performance improvements. Right, uh, next thing we got here is Proton Native version two. If you never heard about Proton Native, it's a sort of, how do you, how do I put it? It's like, so the Electron is this Node.js plus um, browser, essentially the uh, Chromium, right? While Proton Native is Node.js plus the native UI library. Now, what I found interesting is that for version two, they've actually migrated from LibUI, which they used originally, to uh, Qt. So they are now using Qt as the UI library and they're planning to move from Qt to WX widgets which I, again, I'm not sure how exactly. So the justification from moving to LibUI to Qt was that LibUI is slowly developing and it's new and there's not, not many supported features. And then Qt is, you know, this massive library has been around for ages and you can just use it basically, right? So I'm not sure what the justification is for moving from Qt to WX widgets, but I guess we're gonna get one once the proton native update. I also got hot reloading, which is something that I think I want in all of my uh, UI frameworks that I basically have. Uh, same components as React Native, so you can now have kind of compatibility between React Native and Proton Native, but yeah, it's it actually looks really cool. So if you are building desktop apps and you don't wanna use Electron, maybe check this one out. This actually looks really, really nice. And now you can basically build Qt apps using JavaScript and React-like syntax. Uh, so there we go. Right, and the last release of the day we got here today is Node.js version 13.7.0, um, which is for the most part just upgrades to LibUV and NPM. One thing that is my personal highlight is the conditional exports that been uh, have been unflagged, which means you can now use them in all your package JSON, you know, in your packages, whatever you publish. Um, if you never heard about conditional um, exports, there was, I don't think they had a, did it, let me think, uh, node conditional exports. There was a write up conditional exports. There we go, there's in the docs now. So the idea is that you can define the exports property in your package JSON that would override or add specific conditional exports. That is, you know, when it's imported, load this file, when it's in the browser, load this file and so on and so forth, which is uh, pretty damn powerful. And now they are no longer behind the flags. So you can just use them and uh, you know, don't bother about adding any additional flags to Node.js when running that, which is kind of cool. Let me have a look at the chat. Never heard about Proton Native. It seems nice and already is familiar with React. Yeah, I mean, 
It's been around for quite some time. The first version was okay, but kind of wonky. So when I tried it, it was quite buggy and you had to go through a few hoops to make it work. At least this is, this is what happened for me when I tried to build an app that was uh, cross-platform for like Mac and Windows, if I remember correctly. I don't even remember if they supported Mac at the time. Uh, I think they did. And I had some minor issues with it essentially, but in the end, you know, I finished it and it's like worked and, and all, but I just decided that basically I would um, go for something more established. Uh, the cool thing is that the whole like React Native paradigm is getting adopted really like a lot right now. For example, by Microsoft. I don't know if you've seen there's been a tweet circulating lately that shows off the apps where Microsoft uses React Native. And there's like, I think almost all of their mobile apps use it in one form or another, which is just bonkers. And they also have the, so you also have the React Native uh, Windows, I think, right? Uh, whoops, React Native Windows. There we go, yeah. So you got the React Native Windows, which basically allows you to build native Windows apps using React Native, which is just freaking amazing. Not cross-platform, but still. But anyway, right. Uh, so that's it for the releases. Now we got libraries and demos. Again, we don't really have that many today, but uh, we do have some really, really cool things here. So uh, first off, we got a pretty major release from Microsoft. Uh, they released a node library called Playwright, and it's a library to automate Chromium, Firefox, and WebKit with a single API. Uh, so here's the thing. This is basically Puppeteer, but for all three major browsers, which is bonkers awesome. And yeah, so you can see the compatibility metrics. It works on all platforms. It works with, okay, the latest versions of the WebKit, Chromium, and Firefox, but this is evergreen browsers, so this should be perfectly fine. So if you are doing um, browser testing and you were rolling with Puppeteer, you no longer have any re reason to not use this because this basically covers all the current major evergreen browsers ever. Unless you need to support the old Internet Explorers, this is basically the only testing tool you need right now, which is freaking bonkers. Uh, no, Chromium is not WebKit. Uh, Chromium used to use the WebKit as the engine, but then they did the Blink fork and Chromium is no longer, basically it has, I guess it has some leftovers from it, but the WebKit is a completely different thing. So WebKit is Safari, right? So Safari, essentially it's Chrome, Safari, and Firefox is what you see here. It's just the names for the open source versions of them. Uh, slated to be replaced by Progressive Web Apps Desktop. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Okay, anyway, continuing, uh, I mean, Edge, Edge is already, so the Microsoft released the Edge, uh, Chromium Edge, right? So this is now, this is the Chromium Edge, you already can get it, it's stable now, it's the latest version, it's official build and everything. Still missing features, I still wait until they add the sync for all the damn stuff because I want it across all my computers, not just this one. But it's like, you can forget about the old Edge. They basically, they said they're gonna be rolling out the Edge version uh, for every Windows 10 user um, in the last, like uh, uh, through the upcoming months or something like this, basically. At the moment, I'm using Selenoid. Is it like Selenium stuff? No, Selenium is terrible. Like this thing is just, uh, even Cy like, I personally like Cypress is a lot better. Obviously, you know, if you have like legacy stuff, this is probably okay, but oh man, no. You know what? Um, anyway, <laughs> we got Playwright. So again, if you're doing testing with the front ends, just check this out. This looks absolutely amazing. Again, backed by a large company like Microsoft. This is just really, really cool. API looks super similar to what you get with Puppeteer, which is again, uh, really great. And it also can do like stuff like emulate the uh, mobile agents and things like this, which is pretty damn cool. Can non-devs write tests? Uh, it doesn't seem so. I mean, this is just the library, right? I'm assuming um, we're probably gonna get the tools like we had for Puppeteer, which was like um, Puppeteer Recorder. Uh, was it Puppeteer Recorder? It was something like this, right? Yeah, there you go. So you, you got like a uh, Puppeteer Recorder, which essentially allows you to just open the browser, click on things, and then export that as a Puppeteer script. 
I imagine we're gonna get Playwright Recorder in uh, pretty soon, basically, <laughs> because it seems like an obvious thing to do. And you know, the API is not too different from Puppeteer, so it's probably very easy to transfer that. But anyway, if Playwright sounds interesting, do check it out. In my opinion, it's absolutely awesome. I probably should start until I forget that. There we go, and uh, yeah. Right, uh, next thing we got here is Mirage JS. This is a mocking library for frontends, uh, which allows you to completely mock the backend. Now, the interesting story about this is that it was released as a standalone library just now, but it actually has been in use as a part of one of the plugins for Ember JS for a few years, if I understood correctly, from the uh, whole discussion on the Hacker News. But the idea is that essentially it allows you to create a fake server right within your front ends or within tests or you know whatever whatever you like basically and then use the normal fetch or whatever you prefer to query that fake server and get the fake data back including like the thing is that you know it's not just responses where you define them themselves it also supports things like factories fixtures serializers, databases, models, and all that kind of stuff. So for prototyping, for demos, for testing, this sounds like an absolutely amazing package. Um, I usually run tests with React apps within Node.js, so you know I typically go with stuff like Knock, but um, again, it's, it's quite limited and does have things like factories and fixtures and serializers, which obviously you can make yourself, but um, this might be my new favorite library because it looks really, really cool. So if you're doing a lot of testing and maybe a lot of demoing and mocking, then do check this one out. It seems pretty damn amazing. All right. Next thing we got here is React Nice Dates, a responsive, touch-friendly modular date picker for React. Um, looks really nice. Like it's 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 a date picker. You know, like it's just made nice to work with touch and be responsive and everything. Supports ranges and whatever the hell you want. Basically, if you need a date picker, do check this one out. It actually looks pretty damn good. All right, next thing we got here is Calendarize, a tiny utility to generate calendar views. Um, so essentially, this is this is not like calendar library, but rather the generator of arrays for calendars, which it basically you give it a date and it gives you a calendar month, the way it looks as an array, which... I guess could be useful in some cases, but I personally don't really see that many um, applications for this, but maybe you do. So, I mean, it was created, so that means somebody needs it and there's already like 300 stars here. <laughs> so maybe if you if that sounds interesting, if this is something you would use, do check this one out. All right, next thing we got here is Gantt Schedule Timeline Calendar. This is... Um, Gantt schedule timeline and calendar components all in one basically allows you to create any of those views on a given data. Uh, they have components for React, Angular, and Vue, so you can actually integrate it into any of the major frameworks. Seems pretty damn nice, actually. So the API is really straightforward. You essentially just give it a data, give it some rows and columns definitions, and you're basically done. And uh, yeah, it looks pretty fancy. So if you, you know, if you are in need of making gun charts or schedules or timelines or maybe calendars that look quite nice and work with all the frameworks, then do check this one out. It actually looks pretty damn good. Guess those date pickers use it. Uh, yeah, that's actually like if you're building a date picker, you might as well be, um, might, might as well use that one. That's true. Okay, continuing, we got a Spectacle, a React.js based presentation library. So this is a, library for creating decks uh, using React.js that has a ton of really cool features. For some reason, uh, there was a demo somewhere. I think it's a bug either with the library or Firefox, but for some reason it doesn't scale fonts correctly for me. So some of the fonts look absolutely hideous. On the other hand, if I open Edge or Chrome or whatever, everything seems to be working perfectly fine. I think it's a bug within Firefox or something. But yeah, other than that, it's actually a really nice um, deck library. So if you're doing presentations and if you want to do them and react with, well, all the fancy features, aside from terrible rendering of the fonts in Firefox for some reason, 
you can do markdown you can do whatever the hell you want just like nice animations and everything smooth transitions and just whatever the hell you prefer basically and even pdf export right from the build tool they have so there you go if that sounds interesting do check it out okay next thing we got here is blake 3 um blake 3 hashing for javascript uh, what I found cool about this, like, you know, if you, if you heard about Blake, um, then this is this the new fancy hashing algorithm. The Blake 3 is the latest version that was just released, like, I think even in 2020 or end of 2019, basically. Uh, now, the cool thing is that uh, it's not just an implementation of it, right? It works in browser and in nodes. What I found to be really cool is that the authors did it as native known bindings if you are running within node, and the binding is actually compiled for your platform, which, you know, sometimes can be a pain in ass, and WebAssembly. So if you are using Node version that is not compatible with the bindings, or you're running in the browser, or you're running in other environment that is not Node and browser and something different like Embeddable Engine, but still supports WebAssembly, it will actually fall back to web WebAssembly, which is pretty damn cool, to be honest, and I really like that approach. So yeah, if you need a fancy hashing algorithm that is super bleeding edge and super fast, I think it's like one of the fastest, uh, I believe. Do check this one out. It's actually really, really cool. All right. Next thing we got here is Remark Code Sandbox. A nice um, Remark plugin for creating code sandbox directly from code blocks. So essentially what it allows you to do is once you write some code sandbox block, it will automatically convert that into a code sandbox with your given code that you just written in the markdown. So if you're writing a load of markdown and you are writing a lot of code blocks and you wanted to convert them to like full on uh, clickable sandboxes, do check this one out. It actually seems really nice. All right. And the last library we got here for today is SHX or I mean, X. <laughs> I honestly don't know. Probably SHX, right? So it's a portable shell commands for Node.js. Um, now, what it means is that it basically allows you to prefix your Nix commands like ls, rm, echo, touch, cp, make dear, and so on and so forth with shx. And then shx will make sure that it runs correct commands across all the systems, be it Windows, be it VSL, be it Mac, be it Linux. It will basically find the right um, analogous, the right command for what you execute and just run it within the given operating system of the current user, which sounds pretty useful if you need to work across multiple uh, operating systems. Which again, I think with, you know, with the rise of VSL is probably not as important, not as needed in the most cases as it were like two years ago. But anyway, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Right, that's it for the libs and demos. The last thing we got here for today is in the interesting th section. It is the book of secret knowledge. Now, um, there's a collection of inspiring lists, manuals, cheat sheets, blogs, hacks, one-liners, CLI, web tools, and more. Essentially, just as the description says, it's an immense collection of really handy things split by categories uh, and you can basically find just about everything you want in here and it's really really cool like starting from you know web tools and going to network tools things like i don't know what was there like traffic mobi um kubernetes the hard way kubernetes the easy way if you don't like the hard way <laughs> it's a really cool collection of uh, anything you might ever want to remember essentially i probably should start as well so if that sounds interesting, do check this one out. Right, that is it from my side. So this was BXJS Weekly episode 98. Uh, if you have guys, uh, blah, let me try that again. If you guys have any questions or suggestions, feel free to throw, th why am I so bad today? So if you have any questions or suggestions or links that I might have missed, uh, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If not, then we can just wrap it up here. Uh, I'll give you some time to throw the links. Meanwhile, you can find all the things that I've mentioned on uh, GitHub under building X with JS slash BXJS weekly. The link is in the channel description or YouTube description if you're watching the video of this. Uh, we have Discord server. We have uh, bxjs.dev that includes all the links uh, and all the episodes if you just want to read through those. Uh, there is an RSS feed there as well if you care about the links only and don't care about me talking, which is totally fine. 
Uh, we got the Discord server if you want to discuss any of that or just want some help with JavaScript. Uh, we got the podcast and audio form on CastBox, iTunes, and whatever the CastBox sends it to, basically. There is a YouTube channel with the VODs. Um, you can follow me on Twitter if you want my shit posts. Uh, there is a Facebook group that I probably should kill because I never update it. And uh, that's basically it. Right, doesn't seem like there's any questions or suggestions, so... Thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the episodes. Uh, as usual, feel free to send me your creations if you have anything to share. Feel free to join our Discord server for chatting. And uh, yeah, have an awesome rest of the weekend or awesome rest of the week if you're watching the beauty of this. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And I see you next time. Bye.